Well, thank you very much, Chancellor White, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, now that this is essentially the end of your tenure here at UCR, um, we wanted to see how you felt about your past four or so years here at UCR, um, starting with the beginning. So going back to 2008 when you first arrived, what was your first impression of UCR? Diamond in the rough. Uh, so many good things going on. Story not well told. A um, couple things that needed focus and attention, and I just knew we blossomed. So I mean, I saw the the promise of this place even before I got here. But in mean, my first you know weeks and months in Riverside, I had a chance to meet students and faculty and staff and the community members and seeing the facilities. I knew this place was uh, unbelievable, and so it made me think about what, you know, what can we go about doing besides the tasks in front of us to help the rest of the world realize how terrific this place really is and will continue to be. What, what, what were a few of those things? To, to raise its visibility. I think one of them was to, is to really invest in a strategic communications division that had, had good people in it, but it didn't have a, enough resources to make connections to, to put out uh, uh, information virtually and in print uh, around the country about our research activities, our student body. Um, it, it meant um, making relations with media, uh, not only in California, but across the nation, uh, particularly the East Coast. And people would always say, well, why the East Coast? Well, A, we're a national campus, and B, so many foundations and agencies that fund research and fund students, you know, are headquartered back there. So we want them to know about us. And it's a very East Coast centric country when it comes to higher education. And so we have to kind of fight our way in and make sure they just don't look at uh, New York and Michigan and, and, and Florida and Maryland. So, um, so I think that was a big thing. Uh, in retrospect, I didn't realize it in the front end, but in retrospect, um, one of my uh, more powerful things in regard to having people understand and feel connected to us was the Friday letters. I mean, I started them for a different purpose, one really sort of almost uh, selfish person purpose to say, forcing myself to share my thoughts with our community once a week of what's on my mind, you know, and, and I resisted like crazy, you know, making it a corporate sort of well-polished, glossy, well-written, you know, vetted ten times sort of a document, I just write it, make sure I don't have a couple of eyes look at it, make sure I don't have any hanging participles or you know, inappropriate uses of pluralities because I get bashed by our English students. <laughs> um, that has connected us in a way that once I realized that, I made sure that, that uh, I never lost focus of what I was trying to do there. So those are examples of really telling our story in different ways, different means, some more sort of strategic and and sort of industry related, if you will, with the, with the, uh, the media and agencies and foundations. And the other one, very much what's going on in my heart and my head on, on a weekly basis. And are two examples, I think, that helped people realize, whoa, you see Riverside as yeah, some amazing thing. And I want to be part of it. So that campus that you first saw when you came here in 2008, how does that compare to the campus you need today? It, uh, it's a great question. I think, I think I can, I can, you know, I could go down the list of saying things that have changed. You know, there's some new buildings. Um, we've launched the School of Medicine officially. We've launched the School of Public Policy. We've launched the first comprehensive fundraising campaign for the university. We've um, uh, opened the Culver Center downtown. We've put a new track in. You know, our academic credential has gone up, our faculty awards have gone up. But yeah, I can tick off all those tangible things, and those are very important. And, and many of them will have a, just a lasting impact. The, the, the intangible is also very apparent to me. And it's hard to find the words about it to describe what I feel and see and smell and taste. Um, swagger is a word I use, and I don't mean it in a pejorative sort of macho way, uh, unless I'm feeling particularly down and I have to pump up. Uh, but when I say swagger, I think pride. 
I think uh, clairvoyance, I think um, uh, aspiration, I think uh, belief, I think confidence, I think um, uh, destination, <laughs> I think uh, caring, I think uh, compassion, I think civility, I, uh, yeah. I think of a whole host of nouns or verbs or characteristics or emotions but about this place is wonderful, it's unique in that characters. Um, when you put them all together, it's inclusive, uh, it's supportive, and, um, and, and, and maybe it was all here when I got here, but I have enough evidence and enough people who've been here a long time to say it wasn't. <laughs> so I certainly know it's there today, and I'm actually very proud of it, that intangible piece of us, how we feel about ourselves and, and each other, this place and what it means to society and to our students and staff and faculty and community. That may be, along with the 18,000 graduates that I've had a chance to sign their diplomas, may be things I'm most proud of. Now, your, your time at UCR was not without its rough patches. Um, for instance, uh, in December 2011, um, there was the university's release of a set of protest guidelines, um, which the campus at large responded to negatively. Um, do you have any regrets? There were no mistakes during my time. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't have any regrets, although you know the, the release of the protest guidelines was uh, unwarranted and unwise and occurred down in the organization. But when it came to light, I very quickly and very publicly said that was a mistake. We're pulling them down. Um, you know, I. So regret is an interesting question because uh, I guess I mean I'm a very idealistic and uh, uh, very pathologically optimistic person, but I'm not naive. I do know mistakes happen, and so when you make one, when a mistake happens at your campus, either you directly do, or someone in the organization does. Um, you, you know, on one hand you could say, yeah, I regret that happened. But what I think I would regret is we didn't respond quickly and properly when a problem arose. And so there's a pride in, the, in how you handle the, the moments that you wish didn't occur. But it, I think it would be naive to think that there aren't going to be rough moments in a large, complex organization with lots of moving parts and tens of thousands of people. Uh, so I'm proud of the way we responded. Have, you know, if I could rerun the reel on that one, I wish they hadn't gotten posted, but they did. And, and uh, in some respects, the silver lining and all that is it forced a, a, a set of very important conversations about how we go about uh, protecting the safety of our students and faculty, staff, and community and buildings, et cetera, and at the same time embracing the amazingly important social unrest that, that occurs all the time, particularly during our last couple of years around tuition, around uh, Wall Street issues, around, I mean, all of the things that brought brought us as a society to a boil. I mean, I, I endorse, I embrace that. It's a huge positive piece of America, and I think the campuses play a leading role in embracing that. But I can't also not worry about safety issues. And uh, so uh, the, 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 the silver lining of that uh, inappropriate posting is that we have had better and more honest conversations about how to behave as a campus and what kind of policies to have and not to have uh, going forward. So maybe turning a lemonade or lemon into a lemonade is uh, a point of uh, pride, maybe diminished pride, but pride nonetheless. So. I mean, going off that, is there anything that looking back you would do differently? I think one of the, not so much the protest guidelines, I think the, you know, we obviously hosted the Regents meeting um, in January of 2012, and that was the first Regents meeting following the pepper spray uh, incident at Davis and the, and the incidents on Berkeley's campus. And so there was a lot, and plus it was in the throes of the Occupy movement, and so there was a lot of social unrest within the University of California community and the activist community and really the nation uncertainty about the economy, about the wars, about, you know, 
elections are starting to come out with all this negative stuff. I mean, it was just a tough time for society. So uh, my regret is knowing that there was going to be a large crowd here on our campus, knowing that there was upset, knowing that we would need law enforcement to protect the building. And because of the design of the hub, you know, there's multiple entrances to that building, so we needed actually a lot of law enforcement to protect access. My regret is I didn't communicate in advance to this campus and to our students and faculty and staff to expect a large group of people, many having nothing to do with the university outside folks who were interested in our topics, plus law enforcement. You know, and so it, you know, the regret is I think when people who don't, you know, I'm used to seeing that because I go to regents meetings around the state, usually up in San Francisco, and uh, and I. I made the mistake of, of not realizing in advance that our students don't see that. Our faculty don't see that. Our staff don't see that. And so then all of a sudden there's this huge presence of law enforcement on the campus. It's a real outlier, pushback kind of experience. And had I explained it in advance, I think you know there would be some who'd say it was you know you had too many police officers and this, that, and the other thing. And I understand and acknowledge that. But at least it wouldn't have been a surprise. But I'm not, uh, I don't second guess the, the way we actually uh, got through the, that, that region's meeting. Um, and there were some unhappy moments in it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, you just have to sort of manage it in real time. And, and I think we were restrained but effective. Uh, unsolicited, unscheduled, spontaneous interaction with a student. That, Sometimes lasts a minute, sometimes lasts ten minutes or half an hour. Uh, gave me insights into the, I mean, real insights into the fabric of our student body uh, in ways that I couldn't get if I didn't have those encounters. You know, we've had formal encounters with groups of people and listened to concerns and issues and things on their mind, and that's been helpful. But the ones I think I cherish the most are the spontaneous ones because they're genuine. And particularly if they don't know who I am, I love it. <laughs> Which was easier early on, because I didn't know who I was. But now, you know, I have a recognizable uh, grin, I guess, and uh, it's hard for people not to know who I am. But uh, uh, it, it gives me great comfort to know that our students aren't, uh, aren't afraid to talk about real life issues with a guy like me. You know, I was worried when you wear a tie, and a suit, or a sport coat that you know you separate yourself from the people that you you embrace the most and, and our students have such confidence and they know they can talk about anything on their mind and uh, i have benefited by that and if they had an issue i usually connected them to somebody smarter than me that could help solve the problem if it was solvable so uh, you know, it's hard to pick one thing out of the hundreds of thousands that i've been privileged to be part of um, that's, that's, that's it. And what would you consider to be your greatest accomplishment at UCR? As Chancellor of UCR. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm prideful of the new programs we started in medicine, public policy, and faculty recognition. Um, and it would be easy to list one of those. Um, and they are very, very important. Um, I think the... Probably my greatest joy is yet to be for UCR. I don't think I've experienced it. I think it's going to be what our students, our graduates, go out and do for this country. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to say that I know what it is yet. I'm going to keep an eye on people that have been here, and then, and then I'll let you know. I think it's those 18,000, you know, and the 5,000 that will come out in, in June. Who, fortunately, I won't be able to sign their diploma. I'm going to take. I'm going to take credit for many of them. You know, so it's 23,000 students. I think will be the greatest accomplishment, what they do when they leave here. 
What do you see in UCR's future? Where is its trajectory heading? Its trajectory is very clear to me. Um, National University, uh, it'll be ranked among the top, you know, two or three percent on all the right criteria, not on uh, uh, what we, you know, the, you know, I mean, you can be a prestigious university and bring in people from enormous opportunity and privilege, and they'll go on and do great things, and and that's a very wonderful university. And there's many that do it that way. What I think we are so uniquely positioned to do is to bring in very bright students who not for reasons not of their own doing, not had all of the opportunities in elementary and middle and high school or in their community to be part of science clubs or go to summer camps and theater or music, um, who given an opportunity will flourish and blossom. And I've often thought about, um, you know, to graduate from the University of California, any of the campuses, there's a certain level of knowledge and skill that you need to have to get a degree, undergraduate or graduate degree. If you come in from a place of great opportunity or privilege, you come into the university here and in your time, then your slope is, you know, like this. And that's, that's very important. But what I love is that our students in the main have come from a place where there wasn't an enriched high school <laughs> or a lot of uh, family wealth to send you off to summer camp to, to learn science or music you know, or athletics or whatever. But in that same amount of time, you get to that same level of knowledge and skill. So the slope for our students is more often this than this. I think that the, that slope is the sign of greatness is how much value do we add to our student body at every level, professional, graduate, undergraduate, while we have them as a student, um, is going to be our characteristic of greatness. And, um, and then I think the recognition of our faculty's research and creative activity will also continue to blossom. People want to be part of a campus like this. This is the new kind of public higher education, in, not only in California, but setting the pace for America. So, so I think that's where, you know, we're not going to be a Yale or a Princeton or a Berkeley. We don't want to be a Yale or a Princeton or a Berkeley. A wonderful, great campuses. I've got 12 years on the Berkeley campus as a student and as a faculty member. I mean, I love Berkeley, but it's different than, and it's older than Riverside. Riverside is great in different ways, and uh, but not lesser than those other places. We're just different. And I think that's the trajectory we're on, is recognizing that we don't want to emulate somebody else, we want to be us. And, uh, and use our natural laboratory that surrounds us as part of our research. So, you know, we have air quality and transportation and education and English language as second non-English language learners. I mean, we have all of the issues, water issues, uh, sustainability issues, criminal justice issues, migration and immigration, people issues. Um, you know, depressed economy. I mean, we have all of the things that matter to California as a natural laboratory for our faculty research and our student research and outreach. There's very few places that can say that. And uh, how do we capitalize on that asset, I think, is what uh, is happening and will continue to happen. And, um, so, yeah, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Our value. Do you have any parting words for UCR students? We you know the, it's been a, a set of words that I put in play when I came about living promise, living the promise. And I would just continue to think that those are important words for all of us. Um, you know, you could change the word promise to dream. You know, I mean, there's different words one could use, but to me is, is uh, it's important to be not waiting for the next phase of one's life to actually contribute to others. So living the promise is an active word. Living in the, in the here and now, planning for the future, but contributing beyond self now. So it's not only your own personal promise, but growing it, fulfilling it, but it's the promise that you can bring as a student to some other student, 
or to someone in our community or over on the east side or back at home or in a church or a synagogue or a temple or in the hospital, you know, or humane society. I mean, you know, it, 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 it is to me engaging with everything at the moment, not putting life off until you feel like you're a little older, a little more accomplished. Because life really is a series of chapters. And you think back to middle school, you know, that was, that was then. And then there's high school, and then there's college years, and then there's, you know, for many graduate or medical or law or professional schools or the workforce. But, but if you keep waiting for the next one to say, well, that's when I'll get involved, then I think you, 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 you aren't living your own potential, your own promise. But you're not helping others succeed. And I guess the final thing is, um, is when I think back to my time here, my time before here, while I have something to do with being able to do things, you know, it's others that created the opportunities for me and believed in me. And, um, and it was up to me to walk through that door. Um, so sort of living your promise every time a door opened. And, proving to whoever opened it for you that it was the right decision. And then by doing well, you create the next door to open. That's living the promises. And then I think the final thing I would leave with our students, it was yesterday's storm. Here in this office on, on, on Hinderocker, the windows face north and east. And yesterday we had stormy weather. Unusual, it happens and it's good for the ecosystem, no doubt. Not good for the freeways. <laughs> Are people driving on them? Um, but then it broke up and it was clear. There was blue sky and the sun shone on the interdisciplinary building in the Box Mountains that surround the back of the campus. And this most amazing rainbow rose came out of interdisciplinary building and up and over and went right into the sea up on the Box Mountains. And, and, and in terms of a metaphor of this campus and being a student here in life is there's going to be those dark, stormy moments. And then if you stick with it, it's going to be these bright, sunny, rainbow moments. And uh, to embrace them both and, and work hard for more rainbows in one's life. But recognize that it's how you deal with the dark moments. Um, really is the test of character, the test of being a Highlander, the test of being a productive member of society is to come even closer together in the hard times uh, when, when we really need each other. That, I think, is the highlighter spirit. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. That's my pleasure.